Last week, I preached a sermon entitled, What We Need in This Pandemic in Our Election Season. And for some reason, it was cut off about 10 minutes into it. And so we're going to post the entire sermon, the audio sermon, from the actual worship service so you can en uh, enjoy it. Good morning. My name is Lori Stevens. I'm the church administrator here at First Baptist Church of Sparks, Nevada. We're glad you're here. As we face the coronavirus pandemic and the political upheaval in our country, the pastor wants you to know that as a Christian, Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your lives and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The pastor believes the best days for First Baptist Church are yet ahead. He wants to remind you that the gates of hell shall not overcome or defeat the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. The pastor and church staff want to give a shout out to retired Colonel Angelo Anastastados a longtime deacon here at our church as he battles health difficulties and his sweet wife Pam who is recovering from knee surgery. We love you both and we miss you. And now enjoy our old time worship service and as always please remember to help us out by hitting the like button and subscribe. When you do you will be notified when we have new videos or other content. Also we are on Instagram and Facebook. Like and share and subscribe. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now take your bibles the word of god and turn to john 14. john chapter 14 verses 1 through 11 and i've entitled the sermon what we need in this pandemic and in our politics. And uh, Joe's prayed for me, so I'm going to trust the Lord heard his prayer. You know, I've always loved Winston Churchill. I love the movie Churchill. He had a sharp wit. He also had an ongoing public feud with Lady Astor. And by the way, Churchill and Astor were in Parliament at the same time. I think that's where they got uh, acquainted. But uh, she also had a sharp wit. She once said... I married beneath myself, as all women do. <laughs> At one event, Lady Astor became so angry at Churchill that she said, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your tea. To which he replied, and if I were your husband, Madame, I would gladly drink it. <laughs> On another occasion, Lady Astor said, Mr. Churchill, you are despicably drunk. He said, you are correct, madam, and you are despicably ugly. But in the morning, I shall be sober. Oh, my. Now, I think a favorite quote from Churchill applies to our politics and applies to the coronavirus we're going through. He spoke these words during the height of the German Blitzkrieg in World War II. He said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And I think that's great advice. Let's keep going. Better days are ahead. Amen? Amen. And I want to thank you members of First Baptist Church for uh, doing your part in keeping our church and our community safe. So this morning, we're, two, we're at John chapter 14. And uh, we have four gospel stories about Jesus in the New Testament. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The structure of John's story is different from that of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often called the synoptic gospels. And here's why. They follow a similar chronological timeline. And most of the stories are similar. And the stories are about what Jesus said and did in Galilee. 
In contrast, most of John's story takes place in Jerusalem. And he organizes his biography of Jesus around seven miracles that he performed. Now we've already looked at all seven of those miracles. The last one was when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11. And John also highlighted the seven I am statements of Jesus. We've already looked at five of them. We'll look at the sixth one this morning. But perhaps what makes, the one thing that makes John's story of Jesus unique is because John adds this amazing section that I start today. The setting is the upper room. They're in Jerusalem. It's the Last Supper. Judas the betrayer has gone out into the night. And Jesus will be crucified the next morning. But before John recorded the arrest of Jesus, he adds this section of, of teachings. <coughs> and they are to the disciples, but they are also to us this morning. And they cover three chapters, 14, 15, and 16. And this section has often been called the farewell message of Jesus. Then in John 17, we read the words of the longest reported prayer of Christ in the Bible. And it's been called the real Lord's Prayer. In it, He actually prayed for us that night. Then they eventually arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane in John 18. But beginning here in John 14, Jesus shares many spiritual truths to these 11 disciples and to us this morning. But now remember... As I read John 14, the disciples were confused and they're afraid. They were troubled and disturbed that there had been a betrayer in their midst. So it is in this setting of confusion that Jesus spoke these powerful words, including the sixth I am statement. So with that, follow along with me in John chapter 14, <coughs> verses 1 through 11. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to Jesus, <coughs> Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So the 11 disciples were stressed out. Jesus dropped the bombshell that one of the, in the group was going to betray him. And then he told them he was going somewhere and they could not follow him. He told them that where he was going, they could not follow. Now, all of them knew the Jewish leaders were out to arrest Jesus and the 11 disciples. So the stress level was high. The tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. Just so, there's a lot of stress in our world today. Even before the pandemic and our election, many Americans were stressed out. And the threat of this invisible virus has only increased our stress level. Someone said 
we are all stressed up with nowhere to go. In this sermon, as Christians, I want to talk about what we need in this pandemic and what we need in our politics. Let's look at three truths, and I think there are powerful truths that can give us hope and peace in the midst of these troubled times. First, do not let your heart be troubled. Jesus is at his Father's house preparing a place for you. The Bible teaches 2,000 years ago, Jesus arose from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. <coughs> After his resurrection, the Bible teaches he spent 40 days with his disciples. Then they went up to the top, top of the Mount of Olives, and there Jesus stood on it. And then he ascended from their sight back into heaven. So what's he been doing all this time? Well, according to his words here, he's been preparing a place for you and me. That is, Jesus is at his Father's house in heaven preparing a place for us. If you are a Christian this morning, one nanosecond after you die, you'll be in the presence of Jesus in paradise. And I believe we will know our loved ones in heaven. And babies that die, both newborn and preborn, are welcome into heaven. And we will know them in the way the Lord wants us to know them. Abortion is the holy cost of our lifetime. My only comfort that these babies will be safe away from their parents, doctors, and politicians that have killed them. As Christians, please do not vote for a Republican or a Democrat that supports this murderous practice. Amen? Amen. Now listen, we will not be angels in heaven. Instead, we will have a powerful eternal body like the resurrected body of Jesus. And with this new resurrected body, we will not be subject to age, disease, time, or even gravity. The Bible teaches there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It'll be like Eden, the Garden of Eden, only much better. And we'll see Jesus and know Him in a perfect environment of fellowship and worship. The King James Version says, In my Father's house are many mansions. In that verse, Jesus used the Greek word mone, and it means rooms. And it could be better translated, In my Father's house are many rooms. When Paul wrote about heaven, he used the metaphor of a building. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, this is New King James, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Indeed, we groan in this tent, desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling. Jesus said he would prepare a place for us. I'm telling you this morning, heaven is a real place. Skeptics have ridiculed Christians about heaven. <coughs> they say all we care about is pie in the sky by and by. But you know as a Christian, and I know that life, the Christian life is so much more than just going to heaven when we die. One commentator said, it's not just pie in the sky by and by. It's also steak on your plate while you wait. <laughs> but even though some people say that Christians are so heavenly minded, that we are no earthly good, just the opposite is true. I did a little research, not a lot of research, because I, I've heard this all my life uh, in uh, college and seminary. Just about every hospital... Every university, every college, every high school, all charities were all started by Christians. All of them. <clears throat> the first teachers were the pastors. The first textbooks were the Bible. The first schoolhouse was the church house. Those are just facts. As one of my college professors said, then the liberals come in, and they're like parasites, and they destroy everything, including the foundation. 
C.S. Lewis wrote, Throughout history, the Christians who did the most for this present world were those who thought most of the next. Early Christians left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were preoccupied with heaven. In a sense, Christians cease thinking of the other world that we have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven and you'll get the earth thrown in. Aim at the earth and you'll miss both. I want to encourage you this morning, put your faith in our Heavenly Father. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor David O. Sykes tells the story of a pastor friend who had a, told him a story about being on a flight during a storm a few years ago. The flight attendants told the passengers to remain seated with their seat belts firmly fastened. He said the aircraft would su suddenly rise and then fall. Lightning could be seen and thunder heard. He said it was really scary. So he began praying. But when he glanced around, he saw a young girl seated across from him who didn't seem to be worried. He said she was about eight years old. <coughs> she was singing and reading a book. She seemed to be clueless about the bad weather. After they landed, the pastor said, Young lady, you sure were brave during that bad weather that we went through. She smiled and said, Oh, I wasn't worried. My dad is the pilot and he's bringing me home. And just like that little girl, you and I do not have to be afraid in the storms of the coronavirus or the, or the election or any other storm you're going through this morning. You do not have to be afraid of any storm because Jesus will safely take you home. The Bible says Jesus is preparing a place for us and he will return to take us home to his father's house. So do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in Jesus. Second, don't let your heart be troubled. You can be certain about spending eternity in heaven. You know, one of the reasons people are on edge is because there's so much uncertainty. Such as, what if I or someone I love gets the virus? When will this pandemic be over? Will my life ever be the same? Will America ever be the same again? For sure there is a lot of uncertainty in our world. And many people think, if I could just get some kind of assurance that it will work out, then maybe I can hold on. Well, I want to remind you that in the midst of so much uncertainty, there are some things that you can be absolutely uncertain about. One is God loves you. And the other is Jesus died to give you eternal life. Over the years, I've had people who did not, Christians, who did not have, not have the blessed assurance of their salvation. They love the Lord, they love the Bible, they love the church. But for some reason, they never came to full assurance that when they died, they would go to heaven. And that's sad. I've had them say to me, Pastor Morley, no one can know for sure if they're going to heaven when they die. Well, you can. There's a powerful picture in 1 John that guarantees that a Christian can have this certainty of their salvation. And if you haven't, you need to underscore this verse. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written unto you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, do you see that? Know that you have eternal life. So you can know when you die you're going to heaven. It's been said you don't have to have a hope so salvation. And you don't have to have a think-so salvation. You can have a no-so salvation. In the Old Testament, in one of the most beloved chapters of the Bible, David sang about overcoming fear. Here's what he's saying. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then he concluded the song with a testimony of absolute assurance. 
He's saying, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> I love that verse. And I would say, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I bet you, uh, you don't want to miss out on being part of the Father's house in heaven. And if you're not a Christian, here's what the Bible says. God has a room for you. He's just waiting for you to admit that you're a sinner and ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to take you to heaven when you die. Dr. J.I. Packer is a great Christian theologian. I think he's 94 years old this, this uh, year. He recently wrote this about his anticipation of heaven. As I get older... I find I appreciate God and people and good and lovely things more and more intensely. So it is pure delight to think that this enjoyment will continue and increase in some form literally forever. In fact, Christians inherit the destiny which fairy tales only talk about in fancy. We will live and live happily. And by God's endless mercy, we will live happily ever after. Now, that's what the Bible teaches. So don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus Christ. Now, lastly, don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus promised to be your only way to heaven. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus made the sixth of his seven I am statements. Now, remember, the significance of these I am's is that every time Jesus made one, he was identifying himself as God. Remember the Old Testament at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 3 and 4? Moses asked God what his name was, and God said, I am. And so for each of these I am statements, Jesus was claiming to be God. In his conversation, Jesus said, you know the way to the place I'm going. <coughs> Excuse me. He had just been talking about going to his father's house. But one of the disciples, Thomas, wasn't convinced. He had his doubts. And he says, where are you going? And how can we know the way? And Jesus replied with some of the most important words ever uttered in the history of the world. And I am not hyperbolating when I say that. Look at verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> Billy Graham, it is said, preached in the presence of over 210 million people during his ministry as an evangelist. He reached hundreds of millions more on television. And at every crusade site in the language of that land, there would be a huge banner with this verse. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why did he do that? Here's why. Because that is a concise explanation of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And when you read that, it is a bold claim. Jesus claimed that no person could come to God except through Him. There are many religions in this world. And many of them claim that there are many pathways to God. And when you set out here and you might be educated, it sounds logical and it sounds rational. But Jesus left no room for misunderstanding. He said there is a narrow pathway that leads to eternal life. And he said, I am that pathway. Now, that is the preaching of the gospel. That's what I have been doing since the day God called me into his service. And I would say this, when you go to a church of any denomination and you don't hear the gospel, then I'd be finding another church. Amen? In Acts 4, <coughs> after God used Peter to heal a paralyzed man in Jerusalem, these same religious leaders 
who had arranged for Jesus to be crucified, demanded an explanation. And Peter stood up in front of them. He boldly stood up before them and he proclaimed in Acts chapter 4, 10, 11, and 12 these words. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. And then this verse here. There is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And I've said this before. That little Greek word, D-E-I-D-A, translated must. When you see it, it is always translated absolutely necessary. Nobody's going to heaven without Jesus Christ. And some people particularly in academic circles, insist that there was nothing supernatural about Jesus of Nazareth. They like to say that he was a first century Jewish rabbi who had some wonderful moral principles. He might have been a great moral teacher, but that was it. But you can't ignore the claims of Christ in John 14. He claimed to be the only way to the Father. He claimed to be one with God. He said, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Intellectual C.S. Lewis, a brilliant college professor, graduated from Oxford, was an agnostic for many years. But once he seriously considered the claims of Christ, he became one of the greatest authors of the 20th century. He wrote over 30 books, including the Chronicles of Narnia, the Screw Tape Letters, Mere Christianity, and the problem with pain. Here's what he wrote. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. That is, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis said, this is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. He said, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let none of us come with this patronizing nonsense that Jesus was a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Mere Christianity. Jesus didn't say, I'll show you the way, or I am a way. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, I'll teach you the truth, or I am a truth. He said, I am the truth. And he didn't say, I, I'll give you a life. He said, I am the life. Jesus isn't one of the ways to God. He's not even the best way to God. He's the only way to God. <clears throat> if you're here this morning... I don't know what your reason for not accepting Christ is, but it won't hold water. Someone said, these are the days that try men's souls. I am surprised how a panic can run through our country. Some of the things I hear and see and read about. I can tell you all nations and ages have been subject to panics. And yet in some cases, panics have produced as much good as hurt. One commentator said, I love the man that can smile in trouble, that can gather strength from distress and grow brave by reflection. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, 
when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that our country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet and to repulse it. Those are powerful words. But if you think they were written recently, you would be wrong. Those words were written over 244 years ago by the American patriot Thomas Paine. And he wrote that when our ancestors were facing the overwhelming enemy of the only superpower in the world, the British war machine. And so in the midst of the Revolutionary War, he wrote these things. Did you know that it is reported that revival broke out among the Americans? There are reports that in the middle of the winter that Washington soldiers at Valley Forge would gather and have all-night prayer meetings. As we know, with strength and hope and help from heaven, they came through this crisis. And I tell you, just now, we are in the middle of the greatest crisis of our generation. And I see, I hear a lot of panic and uncertainty over this virus and over the election coming up Tuesday. But I want to assure you that our nation and our churches have survived every crisis in the past. And we'll come through this and we'll be stronger than ever. And we will because we stand on the Bible. You know why my faith isn't blind? You know why I think this church is going to do great in the years ahead? Because the gates of hell will not prevail against First Baptist Church of Sparks. Because we stand on the Word of God. That's why. So we will endure. We're going to come through this battle. So let me close with the words of Jesus. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And of course... That starts with you accepting Christ. I want to give you that opportunity. If you're here and you're not a Christian, get up, come forward. Let me pray with you about receiving Christ. If you haven't been baptized, if you're not a member of a church, this church, I encourage you to come and be a part. Maybe you just want to come and, and have a breath of prayer. I'll pray with you. Kneel at the altar. If the Lord is leading you, come. Exercise your faith. And you'll be stronger and better for it. Amen. He breaks the power of cancel sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name.